We now have all the components that we need in order to prove that the geometric Lorentz system is indeed chaotic. So let's do it. Let's prove the following theorem. The geometric Lorentz attractor has the following dynamical features. First of all, infinitely many periodic orbits. That's cool finitely many periodic orbits of each period, where by period I mean period in the Poincaré map. So for example, there's a finite number of periodic orbits of period 17, but in particular, that finite number is bigger than zero. There is, in addition to the periodic orbits, a dense orbit, an orbit that gets as close as you want to any other location within the geometric Lorentz attractor. This is related to the idea of transitivity, topological transitivity, in the definition of chaos, but it's, it's even a little bit stronger. And finally, the geometric Lorentz attractor has sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Now, this all seems like a tall order. How do we go about proving this? Well, here's the idea. Remember how we have set things up in terms of the topological conjugacy between the Poincaré map on the interval from 0 to 1 and the shift map on the space of semi-infinite sequences in digits 0 and 1. Now, what does this mean? If we're given some x in the interval, it has a binary decimal expansion. I don't know. Uh, let's say I, I just write out some sequence of zeros and ones. Then that first digit is telling you which side of the interval you're on. Are you on the left-hand side or the right-hand side? Remember how binary decimals work. And all the additional decimals in that expansion are telling you something about the future because the dynamics is really the shift map. So what you're really seeing when you write out that sequence of zeros and ones is a picture of what the future of this orbit looks like. So what this means in particular is that with the symbol sequence that I've written down, 0 0.011, 0 0.011, 0 0.011, 0 0.011, this is really a period three orbit, assuming that repeating decimal structure exists. Aha, so a period three orbit corresponds to a symbol sequence with period three. If you think about what this looks like, not in terms of the symbol sequence, but in terms of the geometric Lorentz attractor, then the point x that corresponds to this binary decimal is giving you some location on the interval, on the branch line, and the list of zeros and ones is telling you whether your orbit is going around to the left, corresponding to a zero, or to the right, corresponding to a one. And so, in this case, the zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, that is giving you a periodic orbit on this geometric Lorentz attractor. And its period is period three. It takes three trips around the attractor to come back to where you start. The conclusion from our observations is that the set of periodic orbits on the geometric Lorentz attractor are in bijective correspondence with periodic sequences in zeros and ones. So, to our theorem, how many periodic sequences are there of period n? That means you have n digits before it repeats. Well, clearly there are finitely many for each n. It's the number of words in two letters. Oh, wait, but with um, sub blocks that aren't themselves periodic? Hmm, interesting. You might want to think about that. But we definitely have a finite number of periodic orbits of period n for each n. And that number is going to be bigger than one. Now, we also have to prove something about a dense orbit. That leads to some interesting questions. What does it mean for two orbits to be close to one another? What it means is that there are points on the branch line that are very, very close. Oh, okay. Now what that means in terms of two sequences 
is that their binary decimal expansions have to be really, really close. And what that means is that if you look at the digits of the binary decimal expansion, then two points are close if these digits match for the first, I don't know, five or 500 or 5,000 digits. So that's what we mean by close. Now, to the question of how do we find a dense orbit, an orbit that wanders through the interval from zero to one, getting as close as you want to every single point. Well, I'm going to just tell you what the initial condition for a dense orbit is. It is the following point zero one zero 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 one one zero one one zero 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 one zero one zero zero one 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 zero zero one zero one 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 and it keeps going but maybe you see the pattern involved here what am i doing i'm writing down all finite sequences in two digits zero and one all concatenated together why am i doing that i'm doing that because if i want to get any finite sequence of zeros and ones to be part of my future, then all I have to do is shift the decimal point enough places over to the right. That is, if I let time evolve for long enough, I can get a symbol sequence that looks any way I want it to look for the first hundred digits, for the first thousand digits. I just need to let time evolve long enough. Well, that's kind of cool. That's kind of mind-blowing. But are we done? No, we're not done. We have a few questions left to answer. Are the periodic orbits dense? Let's see. Periodic orbits correspond to repeating decimal expansions. Aha! Periodic orbits are going to be dense in the same way that the rational numbers are dense within the reals. That's a really cool deep connection. Is there sensitive dependence on initial conditions? That is, if I start with two points that are really close, what is going to happen over time? And the answer is as follows. If I pick two points that are very, very close, that means that they are the same in terms of their symbol sequences for the first, I don't know, nine digits or 90 digits or 9,000 digits. But after that, then I've got, I don't know what, random strings of zeros and ones. If I let time evolve long enough, if I move into the future, with every time step, I'm losing one digit of information. This means that eventually I have no information about the futures of these two points. And these are such deep ideas. This is really telling us about the loss of information over time within this chaotic dynamical system. That's the beauty, if not the magic, of symbolic dynamics. We started off in continuous time with the Lorentz equations to try to model something about what's happening in the atmosphere. By reducing that down to a geometric version, taking a Poincaré map, and then converting everything into symbol sequences with a shift map, we've gone from continuous to discrete time. And that last step where we're working with strings of symbol sequences is just perfect and allows us to see what is really happening inside this system. That is our story arc.